Welcome to Virtual Humans uh, Lecture 2.3, Surface Representations. Today, we're going to see um, different types of surface representations. And the goal of this lecture is that you understand a little bit what are the advantages and disadvantages of each representation. So as we've briefly described in the previous lectures, in order to model a virtual human, you have to think about how to parameterize the motion. And here you have to think about kinematic change, rotations, transformations in order to um, parameterize the motion of humans. The topic of this lecture will be on the geometry, how to model the shape of people. And we will see that this is a very interesting and very complex topic. Of course, if you want to generate humans that look realistic, you have to think about materials, lighting, texture, and so on. However, the focus of this lecture will be on how to model the actual shape, the geometry of, um, of humans and objects in general. So how do we describe geometry? How do you describe the curve that you're seeing? Well, you could use a linguistic representation, you could say this is a unit circle, or you could use maybe a mathematical equation. Yeah, for example, you could say, well, those are the x, y points, such that the x component is cosine of theta and the y component is sine of theta. Or you could use an equation to represent this curve like x squared plus y squared equals to one, right? This would be an implicit representation of the curve. Or you could say, well, it's a curve that has curvature equals to one, that's a circle. Or you could say, well, it's a curve that is symmetric along any axis. And you could use like infinitely many edges in order to approximate the circle as a like a polygon. Or you could like, use more fancy representations. For example, you could say, well, that's a solution of a differential equation. So there's many possible ways of representing geometry. And the choice of representation will really depend on what you're trying to model. So let's look at some examples of geometry. These are examples of geometry. You have to, the face of the human, for example, is very important because it expresses emotion and it's a fundamental part of communication, also the, the body. And um, it's very important to get every detail right because if you don't, then things don't, like something is missing or, or the communication becomes awkward. If we're thinking about telepresence, for example, and the metaverse. So, Look at the face, it has all these wrinkles and it, there's the mouth and the teeth and then this hair. So it seems like different parts, even of just the face, probably need different representations. To model the face, maybe a mesh is sufficient, but to model hair, you probably need another representation. Maybe you need some volumetric representation or some volumetric or some strains um, to model clothing. Maybe you can get away with meshes, but if you want to deal with topology changes and complex clothing, maybe you need to use an implicit representation. We will see all that um, during the lecture, not only today, but also future lectures. If you're modeling clothing and dynamics, you have to think of a representation that allows you to um, change the shape and make the shape reactive to external forces, for example. Perhaps a mesh is good for this because you have like vertices connected by edges and that sort of resembles like how, how, how an actual surface is composed. Um, you can have shapes that basically split and merge like fluids. For this, probably meshes are not a good representation. You might have shapes that are very complex and very like that are complex at different scales. For example, you have a full city and you want to have detail. So you have to think about scalability here, right? Probably a single mesh is not a good idea here. Or you might have to model complex hair, like what you're seeing here, right? There, perhaps a volumetric representation 
might be better suited than uh, surface itself only. So given all these options, it's a natural question to um, think what's the best way to encode geometry, right? And um, it really depends on what you're trying to model, right? This is a recurrent theme in, in, in graphics and in virtual humans, like it really depends on what you're trying to model. So there is no one best choice and because geometry is hard. So there is a, an interesting quote by David Baraf, who's a, an expert in geometry pr processing. Um, so he's a senior research scientist in uh, Pixar Animation Studios. And his, his quote is like, I hate meshes. I cannot believe how hard this is. Geometry is hard. So everyone that has played with meshes knows that it can be a pain. Um, but there is no replacement that doesn't bring also other problems. So essentially, there's many ways to digitally encode geometry. We have two main types of representations. Those are explicit and implicit. So for explicit, we have, for example, point clouds, polygon meshes, subdivision surfaces, NURBS, visor curves, and so on. Explicit means that we can have access to the points in the surface directly, right? In a very direct manner. Implicit means that the surface is defined implicitly with an equation, a function that, that specifies a constraint on the points or some uh, something the points need to satisfy. And here we have also many choices, for example, level sets that need to be stored, algebraic surfaces, um, we have blobs, and so on. So each choice is best suited depending on the task. So if we look at implicit representations of geometry, um, points are not known directly, but they satisfy some relationship. For example, an implicit surface uh, or a surface is defined implicitly by the equation x squared plus y squared plus z squared equals to one. That's the unit sphere. But we don't necessarily need a mathematical equation. We can have a function which could be stored in our computer such that for every x, y, z, it gives us um, a number that defines whether the point is inside or outside the surface. And um, for example, you could have like this function that takes the value zero if the point is outside, this um, blue dots here, and takes the value one if the point is inside. And now the surface will be all the points that satisfy that f of p is at the boundary, decision boundary between the inside and the outside. So there's many implicit representations, as I was saying, like this algebraic surfaces, and constructive solid geometry, level sets, blobs, fractals, and so on. We will see some of these representations. But first of all, let's play a little game to understand what are the good things about implicit surfaces and what are the not so good things about implicit surfaces. So I'm thinking of an implicit surface like f of x, y, z equals to zero. Like for example, the surface that I showed you before, this one. And I ask you, okay, give me a point on the surface. You can use f to evaluate. You can use, so the game is you can use f in any way you want. And um, the task is to find points in the surface. How do you do it? It's not straightforward, right? Because you can query a point and the function will tell you if it's inside or outside, but you have to query many points until you find a point that is actually at the boundary, right? So we will show there's ways of finding the boundary in an efficient way, but it's never as efficient as with an explicit method. So let's look at another thing that you might be interested in looking at. For example, knowing if the point is inside or outside the surface. This is, for example, important if you're looking about, you're, you're worrying about intersections. You want to know if, for example, a virtual human is intersecting with the 3D world and you want to avoid penetration, for example, of clothing and bodies. It's important to be able to know whether a point is inside or outside the surface in an efficient way. 
So, um, for example, if I would ask you, is the point three fourths, one half, one fourth inside or outside the unit sphere? Well, that's easy to check. I can just plug the equation, x squared plus y squared plus z squared equals to one. And so I can plug this point over there and I see that the x squared plus y squared plus z squared is 9 16th, 4 16th, 1 16th. This is 7 eighths, which is less than one, which means the point is inside the unit sphere. Okay, so this was very quick and very easy to do. So implicit surface make tasks like inside outside tests very, um, very easy. And this is good for intersections and interpenetrations and so on. So explicit, explicit representations of geometry are those in which the points are given directly, right? You have some parameters, right? Such that you can have that they parameterize the surface and then basically you can have access to the points. For example, um, points on the sphere can be defined with the following um, explicit uh, parameterization, which is cosine of u, sine uh, times sine of u, sine of u uh, times sine of v, and cosine of v, right? And any values of u and v within this inter interval, 0 and 2 pi and 0 pi, will give me a point, a 3D point on the surface. So generally, like an explicit representation is a mapping from R2, because the intrinsic dimensionality of a surface is 2, right? It's a, it's a mapping from two dimensions to three dimensions, right? For a surface that is two dimensional and is embedded in 3D. Now you might not have an expression for the whole surface, but you might have expressions for local parts of the surface. And we will see that's one way of encoding surfaces by having many local patches. So there's again, many explicit representations in graphics like triangle meshes, polygon meshes, subdivision surfaces, NURBS, point clouds, and you will see many of those. And you will play with some of those. So now let's play another game with explicit surfaces. So I give an explicit surface and you have to find points on it. Okay, so the surface is f of uv equals 1.23 uv. How do you find points on the surface? Well, you just choose any UV values and you're done, right? The, 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 the explicit representation will give you already points on the surface. Any point that is 1.23 and any pair of values UV will give me a 3D point on the plane, okay? So this plane is represented explicitly. So explicit surfaces make some tasks like sampling points on the surface very easy. Now I have a new surface f of uv, and I want to see if a point is inside. For example, like this is my surface. It has this expression here, and it's basically this dough node over here. And I want to check if this point is actually inside or outside. Well, that's not as trivial to do as before, right? Because like this function here, it only tells me how to sample points on the surface, but it doesn't tell me whether the point is inside or outside. So this is something you cannot easily do with explicit surfaces. So in conclusion, some representations work better than others depending on the task and what you want to do. So going back to implicit surfaces, um, perhaps the most basic and historical use of implicit surfaces in computer graphics is basically algebraic surfaces. This is basically composing shapes with, um, with, um, with mathematical equations. So basically, like the surface is the zero, is <clears throat> the zero set of a polynomial in x, y, z. So essentially you have this, for example, this, explicit, this implicit equation, x squared plus y squared plus z squared. Um, if you want to have a donut, you have this equation over here. But if you want to have more complicated shapes like a heart, you have like something like x squared plus nine times y squared divided by four plus z squared minus one um, to the cube. And so this equals to x squared plus z. Well, you see that this is not so easy to define, right? And this is just a simple heart. 
if you want to model things like um, a cow or a car using a mathematical equation, it's going to be really difficult. However, um, it's hard. However, like you can perhaps construct complex shapes by composing simpler shapes. And this is a theme that is actually quite um, often used in computer graphics. You have, um, with implicits, you can do operations and shapes very easily. You can do, for example, union and intersection and difference. Um, it allows you to do all these um, operations very easily, something that you cannot do with explicit, right? If you would have two meshes and you have to find um, the union shape, it's not trivial how to do, right? So the idea is that you could basically chain different operations like union, intersection, and difference, and so on, in order to produce more complex shapes. So you could basically extend this and not combine shapes with Boolean operations, but basically blend them in a smooth manner. So for this, you could use, for example, like distance functions, which give you for every point in space the closest, the distance to the closest point on the surface. And then like this, you can blend any two distance functions, right? As we can um, observe over here. So essentially like, um, like one question, um, oh, this is chopped. Uh, yes, so one question I wanted to ask you is like, how do you implement like a Boolean union of two distance functions? Well, essentially you just have to take the minimum of the two distance functions and this will create the union. So you see that this is fairly straightforward um, to do, like to, do, to combine shapes um, using implicit representations. Now, if you're using like this, um, this basically, um, these basic shapes, you could compose them to, com to, to generate very complex scenes, like what you can see here. Um, so I, I suggest that you go to the following website. There's a, there's a guy that actually like um, has many videos of scenes that are purely constructed out of distance functions. So essentially, you can see the code next to it, and it's basically every column here, every single tile that you see here is a mathematical equation that represents that object. So although this is very um, artistically very interesting, it is really beautiful, it's, it's, it's very difficult to do, right? It's very difficult to obtain what we want um, because like, it's very difficult to represent every single geometry in the world with a mathematical equation, even if we combine them, right? Even if we like generate scenes composed of simple, simpler objects. So one way of addressing this is like to use level sets. So basically, um, uh, we, we've seen that implicit surfaces have some nice features like merging and splitting, but of course it's very difficult to describe complex shapes or in closed form. Um, so an alternative level is level sets because you can store a grid of values approximating the function. So essentially you would just have a 3D cube and you would store for every point Every voxel is called like it's a it's a it's a it's a little cube um, representing a point in space. You store whether this point is inside or outside, or you store the distance to the surface. So this is basically you basically store um, the full function right, in memory. So this is like more flexible. You can have more. You don't need the mathematical equation because it's all stored there. However. Um, it provides more control, right, over the shape, but like you need storage and um, essentially you will need like a lot of voxels in order to have like a sufficiently detailed shape, which might be a problem. So that might be a problem nowadays, and we will see this. Um, a common trend is to store this, um, level, like replace these level sets by neural networks. So essentially you have instead of storing the shape into these grids, right? You, you use a neural network that you can query for every 3D point in space and it will give you the distance to the surface. And you can store in a neural network many objects. 
right? And depending on what you condition the network on, like you will get one object or another. So for example, this is um, an example of one paper that we published a couple of years ago, which um, essentially with a neural network that represents surfaces implicitly, um, we can recover from a sparse point cloud, we can recover the dense um, point cloud of, of the sea. And here you can see that this is a single neural network that has been trained in order to, um, to complete the scene. So the network here takes a point in space and it outputs a distance to the surface. And then based on this information, we can recover the actual surface. We will explain later in later in the lectures, like why this is uh, a good idea and why it turned out that this representation is so um, beneficial for deep learning. So implicit surfaces are very widely used in medical imaging because you have um, like different layers and um, this is very like, um, this calls for a level set encoding of these volumes. So where at each level set you might have um, different surfaces of the volume. So of course the drawback of level set is that you have um, now O of N3, right? Because you have three dimensions. And so if you want more and more resolution, this scales cubically is not good news um, for storage, but also for processing if you're doing like learning. Um, so you can reduce the cost by storing only a narrow band around the surface. Um, but still, this is, um, this is one of the main limitations of using these level sets. Another thing that you might be interested in, um, or another thing you have to think about when you're choosing a representation is how easy it is to compute normals and closest points. This is typically very important for rendering. For example, we need to know the normals or for example, like to register one point cloud into another, we need to be able to find the closest points from points in space to the surface in an easy way. So if you use an implicit representation and use the, the distance field, like the distance to the surface is, is very easy because it's given by the distance field itself. So the distance field F of P gives us the distance from P to Q, where Q is the closest point on the surface. So um, F of P already gives us the distance. So that's good news. Now, how do we get the normals of the surface? So I'm going to tell you the normal at a given point P on the surface equals to the gradient of this function F of P. Now, why do you think that's the case? Pause the video and take some time to think why this equation is true. Well, think about it. F of P gives us the distance to the surface and the gradient will tell us the direction in which the distance increases the fastest. Okay, so we know that if we move along the surface, how should the distance change? It should not change, right? It should be distance equal to zero, right? So along the surface, the level set, we have no change, right? no gradient. Therefore, like perpendicular to this surface, there should be the gradient, which is the direction in which you have the maximal change. The normal cannot be any, like cannot differ from this gradient because otherwise it means that it has some component along the tangent plane and that cannot happen for a normal, okay? So that's why this gradient of F of P equals to the normal at that point. So that's also easy to compute. And the closest points, if you have a distance field, it turns out this very easy formula that, um, that actually we use in some of our research, which is basically um, how to project a point to the surface and find the closest surface point for a given point. So if I have a point, for example, here, right? Um, the gradient tells me the direction in which I will find the closest point because of this equation over here, right? If I take the gradient, it will point towards Q, yeah? It will point towards P minus Q. And now, um, 
or in the opposite direction. And now I have to know how many units of distance I should move in order to land on the surface. Well, imagine that like the query point P is over here. Well, how far I am from the surface? I am F of P units of distance away from the surface. So all I need to do is to take the gradient, which tells me the direction and multiply it by F of P, which is the distance to the surface. One thing I didn't mention, which is important, is that in a distance field, the gradient will have unit um, norm because like the distance in the maximum direction of change, it will change only one unit at a time. Okay, so the pros of implicit surfaces are that the descri description can be very compact if you use these algebraic representations and like these blobs. It's easy to determine if a point is inside the shape. You just query the function and it tells you that. Other queries might be easy, for example, like the distance to the surface or, um, yeah. So for simple same shapes, the exact description is, um, there is no sampling error and it's easy to handle changes in topology. The problems are that it's expensive to find points in the shape. Right? It's difficult to know which points are in the shape. That's something that is not so trivial to do. And also, like it's not so trivial to model very complex shapes unless you store these level sets or you encode the shapes with a neural network, as we will see. OK, so what about explicit representations? So perhaps the most simple one is points like you can represent the surface as a list of points, X, Y, Z. And why is this particularly important is because that's the output of any 3D scanning device or any computer vision reconstruction algorithm. You, you have points. Points are typically or oftentimes augmented with normals and um, they can easily represent any kind of geometry. They can deal with topology changes because actually we are ignoring the connectivity. So that's kind of like cheating. And if you have a dense point cloud, then you can, it's easy to render it. Um, however, in practice, you typically have a sparse point cloud and that's not easy to render. You have to do something. You have to place a disk there or a sphere make some approximations. It's more difficult to know about occlusions, to reason about occlusions. So this makes point clouds like um, sometimes not so well suited for um, computer vision tasks. And um, yeah, it's hard to interpolate under sampled regions and it's hard to do processing because you don't know what is connected to what. So for example, like if, if you have to think about dynamics, you don't know the connectivity, you don't know what is connected to what that that's difficult to do if you're doing for example clothing dynamics and you don't know the connectivity how do you know which points influence which other points for example so a representation that is more powerful but much more tricky to deal with is a polygon mesh where you store vertices and polygons so basically you store the points and polygons that tell you how these points should be connected this might be triangles or quads if you connect three vertices or four vertices at a time. So it's easier to do processing and simulation and you can do adaptive sampling. So you could have like lots of faces, faces, I mean triangles. So, so I will use the word faces sometimes um, to indicate triangles. They are also called faces. Um, so you, you might use lots of triangles for some parts of the shape and less triangles for the other part of the shape and so on. However, like the data structures might get more complex and, um, yeah, in general, dealing with topology changes is really a problem. So imagine like I'm dealing with this shape over here, what we had before, and the shape splits. If I'm using an implicit representation, that's no problem because I just changed the F of P, right? I could basically imagine that this is like parameterized with a neural network or I store it in memory um, with this grid, right? And I could just 
change the f of p and then this will handle the topology change if i'm now doing like representing the surface with a mesh going from here to here is a real pain because i have to know how the new vertices after the split for example do like a cell splitting into two i have to know which vertices connect to which other vertices now and keeping track of these changes is very complicated and more importantly this process is not differentiable if you use an implicit function like you can have this split and everything is still differentiable because all we care about is f of p and the der derivatives of f of p so you can already see um, where an implicit function might be more suited than an explicit one so exactly so to model like meshes you basically store vertices as triplets of coordinates and then you have triangles or faces that indicate how to connect those vertices so they have indices that indicate which vertex connects to which other vertex or you could have like for volumes you can, might have tetrahedrons that basically um, um oh sorry no this example is like so for example you could have a shape very simple shape which is a tetrahedron um which basically is defined with the different triangles um, connecting the vertices. So what do you do with the points inside the triangle, right? How do you know where the point is, for example? Well, you can use barycentric interpolation. That's um, easy to do. You have three points, for example, PK, PJ, PI. And if you want to know points in the middle, they are going to be um, a convex combination of this points on the edges, uh, on the vertices, right? So you might obtain a point P in the middle of the triangle as phi i, p i, phi j, p j, plus phi k, p k. So how easy it is to compute normals? Well, one option is that you can compute a normal per phase, and that's easy to do because you can consider the vector going from P2 to P1 and from P3 to P1, and you could take the cross product and this is going to give you the normal to the plane and you can have a normal per triangle that might not look very smooth so this is the fung lighting and it might look a little bit triangulated another option to get a smoother um, normals is to um, interpolate the face normals uh, like uh, at a vertex by looking at the neighboring triangles and then you can interpolate like the normals along the triangle using barycentric interpolation for points inside the triangle, right? So the normal um, for a point inside the triangle is parameterized with this phi, uh, phi 1, phi 2, phi 3. These are the convex coefficients. Then um, they basically is a convex combination of the normals at the vertices P1, P2, and P3, yeah? So computing normals in meshes is not no big deal. It's um, it's easy to do. It's not so easy to do with point clouds. With point clouds, you have to do something. You typically have to do some sort of local PCA in order to approximate normals, right? Because you don't know the connectivity. So what about distances? Well, if we have like a parametric surface, for example, like this mathematical expressions that give me for every UB pair, like the X, Y, Z point, the mapping from R2 to R3, then um, I can get normals taking, uh, like getting like the, 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 the cross product of two vectors on the tangent plane. So the derivative along U and the derivative along V, and I can take the cross product of these two vectors on the tangent plane, and I get the normal, right? How do I compute the distance? Well, um, I have to find, for a given point, I have to find a point on the surface such that um, the, the segment or the line connecting the point and, and, and the point on the surface is perpendicular to the tangent plane, right? Or it's parallel to the normal. So I need to find the point F U B such that Q minus F of U B cross product of normal equals to zero. Yeah. How would you do this with a mesh? With a mesh, you don't have like this explicit 
or this math I shouldn't say it is explicit you have you have you don't have this this mathematical equation mapping from UB to R3 there you have to typically find the closest triangle and then find the closest point in the triangle that satisfies this equation over here so for this you need to use some acceleration like uh, some data structure to accelerate the search right to find the closest uh, triangles for a given point. And that's something you have to do very often. For example, when you do registration, which you will do, you have to find the closest triangle on the surface quickly. All right. So we said that four points in the middle, we can use barycentric interpolation. And this is basically a linear interpolation method where like f of t is, is basically like this convex combination of the function values at the extremes, right? Or at the vertices. Um, the question is, of course, why should we linear, like why should we limit ourselves to, to linear basis functions, right? This is um, this convex combination, you could think of it as a as a basic linear combination of two functions, right? So can we get more interesting geometry with other bases? And um, so the answer is yes. For example, we could use polynomials, right? Linear, inter linear interpolation are first order polynomials, but we could have more flexibility using higher order polynomials. So the first basis that comes to mind is basically one x, x squared, x3 for polynomials, right? But instead of using this basis, one typically uses the Bernstein basis, which are um, following this um, equation. So essentially is B of K over N. So um, so K indexes the, the, the basis and N is the degree of the polynomial and X is a value between zero and one. And you have like this um, N choose K and you have this expression over here, X K one minus X to the power of N minus K. So why would you like to use such polynomial? Well, the thing is that it's more flexible. It allows you to adjust um, the height um, like more easily. So for example, like notice that only one basis takes value one at the extreme and only another basis takes value one at the other extreme. So if I want to, for example, like match a given endpoint, Right. I only have to deal with this basis, right? If I want to match the other endpoint, I only have to deal with this basis. That's not true with this usual basis for polynomials, right? And essentially points in the middle are also, you know, like sort of every basis has like a, dominates a region of the interval between zero and one. You could think of it this way. So essentially, um, a Beisler curve is a curve expressed in the Bernstein basis. And um, essentially, like to parameterize the curve, you have like this curve parameterized with S. S is controlling like going along the curve. And basically, you have this um, linear combination of um, these basis functions modulated by the control points. So the control points are modulating the different bases. Um, so for n equals one, we get just one line segment. For n equals three, we get this cubic Beisler curve. So for example, like if we have these control points, P0, P1, P2, P3, um, the, the curve we, we, we would obtain would be a smooth, smooth curve that interpolates the endpoints, P0 and P3, and smoothly goes close to these other control points. Another important property is that the curve will be tangent at the end segments and also will always be in the convex hull, which is, for example, useful if you want to do rasterization. Okay, but what if we want to model a more complicated curve, like given by these control points? Well, what's going to happen is that you're not going to have enough degrees of freedom. And if you start like increasing the degrees of freedom, it, it, it won't interpolate very well, 
right? It's very hard to control and it, it just would not work well if you have too many control points. So how can we how can we address this problem if we have like many control points? Well, what you can do is like um, basically piece together many visor curves and impose some constraints at the connection. Okay, and um, essentially what you're gonna require is that the visor curves match at the point and that their tangents also match. And so this very simple technique is widely used in essentially any program like PowerPoint, Illustrator, um, Keynote, every font you see on the screen is composed of visor curves. So every time you look at text, you're looking at these visor curve polynomials, actually, right? Also for file formats and so on. Um, so mathematically, what you do is like you, you patch together all these visor curves and then basically um, um, a, in a single visor curve, like the interval like goes from zero to one effectively. So in order to make it to go from zero to one, you have to do U minus UI divided by UI plus one minus UI. So you just have to see that, you know, when U takes the value UI, we're at zero. When U takes the value UI plus one, this takes value one. So this um, little visor curve goes from um, like the, 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 the arc length, right? It goes from zero to one. Okay, so to get seamless curves, we need the points and the tangents to line up right so for example this is not what we want because these points do not connect here they do connect but the tangents do not match so this is the tangent and you see that they do not match what we want is curves that actually match in the in the point and also in the first derivative to make it even smoother you could also impose that the second derivative also matches right to get an even smoother um, curve so each curve, so first the natural question is like, okay, how do we achieve that? So each curve is cubic. Uh, so you have here like the following polynomial, right? And uh, so of course it's um, here um, cubic. And the natural question is like, how many degrees of freedom do we have? And how many constraints do we have? So let's think for a given curve, we have these four control points, right? So we have like um, thinking in vectors, we have um, four vector degrees of freedom, but then we have that the points need to match and the tangents need to match. So we have two vector um, constraints. So we are good because we have for every curve, if we're looking only at one intersection, at, at, at the connection of one, right? We have four degrees of freedom, and we have two constraints, so we are we're good. Now, what would happen if I want to create a closed loop? Would it still work? Well, yes, because for each curve, I have four degrees of freedom, and I have four constraints, two at each end, right? So two constraints for each point on the curve. So it's still um, the number of degrees of freedom match the number of uh, constraints. So, and that's perhaps one reason to use um, these cubic visor curves. So would it work with a quadratic visor curve or a linear visor curve? Well, no, because you wouldn't have enough degrees of freedom. Okay, but these are curves, and the question is, how do you do this for surfaces? So what you can do is you can leverage the curves and obtain a surface patch by doing a tensor product between the curves. And this is just a fancy name, but what you're basically doing is like um, obtaining every point in the middle by just multiplying f of u times f of v, right? And that's how you obtain this function of u and b, right? So now, like, instead of 
visor curves, we have visor patches. And um, so the basis will look like this, okay? And again, you're gonna have control points that modulate each of these bases. And so with the control points, you will just get different surface patches. So you have a linear combination with weights given by the control points of these basis polynomials. And you can play the same game. You can basically ask that the patches match at the when you connect them, and you can ask that the their tangents match. And uh, like this, you can obtain smooth surfaces. So now we can ask the same question as before: Can we always get continuity and tangent continuity? So C one. You have to think, this is not so easy to answer. You have to think about the degrees of freedom for every patch and how many constraints I have. So it turns out that if I have a, an easy connectivity, like this thing over here, where um, every vertex is um, essentially shared across four patches, right? You have this um, four connectivity, then everything works out and you have enough degrees of freedom to satisfy the constraints and so on. However, this connectivity is, um, this works for this connectivity, but it would not work for other more complicated connectivities. And it turns out that many surfaces cannot be represented with this simple connectivity. In fact, any surface that is not looking like a donut, you cannot represent with this, um, with this connectivity. You need other connectivities. At some point of the surface, you need some other connectivity. Another problem of uh, visor curves are that essentially they cannot represent conics. They cannot even represent a circle. But there's a solution to this. And again, the solution is to use homogeneous coordinates. And here's kind of a like a, an interesting idea. So basically, you're gonna model the curve in homogeneous coordinates, and then you're gonna do linear project linear projection onto the plane in order to obtain the conic. So it's sort of like you're modeling the curve in a, using one extra dimension and then you're gonna project it back. Yeah. So we've seen this idea like already in the image formation, um, in a way quaternions are also like adding one dimension in order to um, be able to do new things. So here this um, appears again. So the result of doing this is called a rational B-spline. So this motivates the use of, um, of NURBS, which are non-uniform rational B-splines. <clears throat> so where does the name come from? So first of all, the knots are at arbitrary locations, and this um, that's why it's called non-uniform. And it's based on, on rational B-splines. That's why it's like expressed in, in homogeneous coordinates. And that's why it's called rational because you have this quotient. Right? You divide by the homogeneous coordinate, as we saw in the image formation class. Um, and you have a piecewise polynomial curve. So um, that, that brings the name of B spline, right? And one interesting property of NURBS is that the homogeneous coordinate controls the strength of a vertex. Um, so, for example, like here, um, we're showing like for these control points different homogeneous coordinate, which um, which makes the curve go closer to the control point, or um, or basically like like for lower weights it ignores the control point more. So this might be interesting if you want to have parts of the surface that are um, smooth and like has to have like some sharp um, curves in other parts of the of the surface. So how do we get, how do we go from curves to surfaces? Well, you guessed it again, we use the tensor product and um, we have the same story again that we can have like patches and we can connect them to produce surfaces. And um, it's nice because they are easy to evaluate. They, they, are, they can produce exact conics and they have a high degree of continuity and they are still widely used in, in for medical applications and for, for graphics. Um, however, they are still hard to 
piece together, like it's hard to piece together patches and it's hard to edit. A much simpler or easier to, um, to control, like with less degrees of freedom um, representation, explicit representation is the subdivision surface. So essentially there is an interesting property, which is like, if you start with some control points, which is called the control curve, and you repeatedly split the edges and take a carefully designed average of the existing, uh, of, the, of the vertices, an averaging rule, and you obtain like a curve that is smoother than the previous curve. And if you iterate this process, you split the edges again and then do some sort of average. And there's many schemes for averaging that will produce different limit surfaces uh, or limit curves. Like what is interesting is to the limit, you get a nice limit smooth curve with provable smoothness. And this is often the exact same curve as some well-known spline schemes that we've seen before. So of course here you might ask yourself, is subdivision an explicit or implicit representation? What do you think? So it's, it doesn't provide a way to get points on the surface immediately. You need to do some operations. However, you do not have like a function that represents some uh, constraint on the points. And therefore it's not really an implicit um, surface, right? It's, it's rather an explicit representation. So subdivision surfaces have been used in, in computer vision, for example, like to represent the shape of dolphins. This is a really cool paper um, that basically reconstructed and built a statistical model of, of the shapes of dolphins from um, images, directly from images, um, which is, it was very inspiring for many of the works on, on human body modeling uh, nowadays. And <clears throat> uh, so of course, like how do you like generalize this, this scheme of like uh, subdivision curves to subdivision surfaces um, you basically have the same process, but you start with not with a control curve, but with a control cage, and then you subdivide each element, update the vertices with, with some local averaging, and there's many possible rules, like two famous ones are the Catmull clark for quad structures and loop for triangle meshes, loop subdivision for triangle meshes, and, um, and then you get like the smooth subdivision surface. So common problems with subdivision surfaces or common issues are that there's, there's a trade-off between like, it's, it's not clear whether they are interpolating the, the, the control points or they are approximating them. And then, um, and then it, it, yeah, you have to think about the continuity, the vertices and so on. However, they are like very easy to use because you only, you control the shape fully with the control points. Right, and so they are easier than splines and these other um, polynomials because you have less parameters to deal with. So it's it's much easier um, to control. They might be a little bit tricky to implement um, in some cases. You have to um, have these averaging schemes and so on. But and to compute derivatives um, of, for example, like point distances to the surface might be a little bit intricate but it can be done and and it's actually widely used in practice and um and it 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 it, it has been recognized with an Ac academy award and um it's still very much used for for example like producing um uh, um animation movies like for example like this um uh, this is a snapshot of the movie um Gary's game which is was one of the first uses of subdivision surfaces in computer animation Okay, that's all I wanted to um, describe about uh, surface representations. We will see much more when uh, when we like see more advanced techniques, uh, but these are the basics. Um, so these slides are almost fully based on the computer graphics lecture of Keenan Crane. You can um, check that lecture, very, very cool lecture which covers many more topics in computer graphics than, than we will be able to cover. We'll focus more on 
on on the virtual humans um and yeah maybe like to summarize like there's no best representation for surfaces um implicit surfaces are very good for topology changes they are very good for um inside outside tests explicit surfaces are giving us the points much more directly sometimes deforming the surfaces is easier um this polynomial based explicit representations are used and they were very popular in graphics in computer vision and machine learning they are not so popular because essentially these basis functions of polynomials are basically giving us like some smoothness properties which are present in like these shapes that we're interested in. but those um those can be also learned using a neural network and that that's typically the reason why those are um not as useful or not so necessary if you can learn those properties directly from training data for example okay um that's all thank you